Devin, it's good to see you today. And um, we're in our eighth class on how to study the Bible. People that have been trucking along with us kind of know this story. Um, Devin had a great idea about doing a series of lessons on how to study the Bible. We wanted to make this available to the entire congregation to give them the tools, kind of the, the suitcase handles uh, that you can take with you when you read the Bible. We, we want to equip you to read scripture. So Devin had, had done a lot of research on this, and when I heard his uh, vision for this, I thought, man, this would be excellent. And so this current time where we have uh, video capability and we, we've tried to enhance that, we thought this would be a great time for the wider church uh, at large to hear this type of teaching. And last week we talked about genre. Uh, and I think that was interesting for me to go back and, and review some of that that I've learned before, how the genre of literature matters. And today we're going to talk about a very critical component. I know from my own personal Bible study, and, and Devin, why don't you share with us really quick that component that we're going to talk about today? Yeah, so we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, it, <laughs> it's tough to find a starting point with it. So, I mean, starting in the Enlightenment, we had this idea of, of kind of demythologizing the text. And part of that, you know, a lot of people were really uh, didn't like that idea to, uh, you know, take the spiritualness out of the text, which was a negative of it, but a positive side of it was, hey, we need to understand what's going on and we need to break down what's going on in the background of these texts situate these texts within their, you know, historical spot in the, you know, the history of time. And that will really tell us what's going on. That way we can finally um, understand meaning and understand what's going on in these texts. And, and it's a, it's been a really useful tool. I think as, you know, uh, Christian evangelicals, you know, church of Christ members, using historical tools to under better understand the text is really valuable to us. So what we're looking at today is, is a combination of historical background as well as cultural background. And there is a slight difference between the two, but for our sake and purposes, we could just say historical analysis, or we are going to um, look at the historical nature of these texts and in doing so, um, it really opens up the text for us. So hopefully it's going to be a good little study. Devin, I've always uh, looked at this as time travel. You know, we don't have uh -huh. the, De the DeLorean from Back to the Future, um, but we can use these tools to go back in time. And I've read, uh, I can't remember the source, but it was a class I took maybe last year. We talked about in some sense, our senses in the 21st century, we get back to the first century a little bit better than say someone that lived 800 years after Christ. Yeah. Um, because of the tools of, of science and how we have uncovered a lot of manuscripts and uh, constructed the view of, of the ancient world. And now something's really changed Devin. that's exciting too in biblical studies for the longest we studied like the cultural elites and their culture and their day-to-day mm -hmm. -day life. But a great shift has happened in say the last 50 years to focus more on the common person. What was their life like? And that's really going to help us with scripture because we, we meet a lot of common people mm -hmm. when Jesus is speaking to people in the summer on the Mount. These are just regular folks trying to live life that are eking by an existence and it adds some perspective to the text. So I, I like to think of this as time travel, if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's a great way to talk about it. And, and that's good language to use also time travel. Um, if anyone, if this is an interesting concept to anybody, I think a really good book to start you off on this is Backgrounds of Early Christianity by Everett Ferguson. That's probably like the easiest read. Uh, it's, it's a big book, but he covers, like you're saying, he's, he's, he's more concerned with the ordinary guy. And so it, he talks about the, the, the sports that they were into, uh, the art that they participated in, I mean, everyday life. So Backgrounds of Early Christianity by Everett Ferguson is a really good book to, to look into. Yeah, one time I emailed Everett Ferguson and he answered it and I thought I was like really special. You're kidding. I think he answers everybody because he's just a really a nice guy. But I sent him a question about something in one of his textbooks and he answered it. Uh, no he's a way. really humble fellow, but he is a he's the top guy like in the world on history of Christianity, probably if you're wanting to know who is the guy. 
in the book you recommended, I, I couldn't recommend it more. I know it's helped me so much uh, yeah. in, my, in my study of backgrounds. It's a great book. And he is, he is, he's got a great book on baptism too, uh, yes. where he looked at baptism in the first three to 400 uh, years of church history. And that's one of the best treatments I've, I've read on baptism in early church. Yeah, he's good. I think he's from Abilene Christian, or maybe he teaches at Abilene Christian. Yeah, I think he's retired. Um, retired, okay. He's emeritus or something like that, maybe. From Abilene, yeah. But yeah, he, and he's uh, involved in local church, too. He's not just an academic. He's a, a churchman, too. So Cool. I think well, I'm going to go ahead and work through our slides, if that works for yeah, you. Yeah, I, I'm excited, because you've got some text for us today to kind of look at and yeah. get into some, some biblical text and look at how this works. So I'm, I'm excited. Uh, so, so really, uh, we are going to look at text, and we're going to look at the context of different scriptures, and I think that's important. And, and context is important; historical context is important. And what I'm going to try to draw out are three three basic questions you can ask yourself when you're studying scripture. So, out of this whole class, hopefully, you're going to walk away. You can write down these uh, questions, maybe even in the back of your Bible, write down three questions. And so every time you get to a text that's puzzling, uh, maybe you can refer to these questions and it can kind of guide you along in your study a little bit. So um, again, why is context so important? Uh, well, you've probably heard the phrase over and over again, uh, hey, you're taking that out of context. If you follow anything <laughs> uh, news related, you have politicians, celebrities, constantly having to say, well, hey, that tweet's being taken out of context. Or no, 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 that interview, that, that, that portion of that interview is being taken out of context. We hear that all the time. And, and hopefully it's kind of reiterated to us that context is important. You get someone's full message, what they're trying to say when you look at the context of something. There's a 1991 film, Let Him Have It. Have you seen that, Chris? I have not. I, I, have, I haven't either. I've just okay, heard about I was, it. I was about to be really impressed that you had Seen a film from the early 90s that I have not seen. So. From my birth year, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, You're going to be so, very impressed. <laughs> uh, but this, this uh, movie follows the, a real-life scenario that happened in the mid-50s where two boys had uh, committed a crime. They ran on top uh, of this building. They're on the roof. The cops pursue them. Um, one of the young men are uh, termed mentally slow, and the other one of the two boys has a gun. And as the cops uh, run up the, the stairs to the top of the building, um, Derek Bentley, who was termed uh, mentally slow, uh, tells the other boy with the gun, hey, let him have it. Well, the boy shoots the cop. Uh, they end up going to, to, to trial. And the, the defense and the prosecution are debating over this term that Bentley used. The defense is saying, uh, Derek Bentley used this term in saying, hand the gun over to the police. Let him have it. Let him have the gun. While the persecution was saying, no, Derek Bentley was saying, let him have it, as in shoot the cop. Well, Derek Bentley was uh, tried and convicted. Uh, and then just uh, uh, 30, 40 years later, I think it was, I think it was the late 80s, uh, he was exonerated. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's a crazy trial, but it's all recorded in this 1991 film, Let Him Have It, uh, centered around that phrase where context was really, really important. Uh, similar context is, is found in scripture where context is really important. Um, John chapter two, verses 25 through John chapter three and verse one. Uh, when you begin to look at the context of what's going on, a passage can really open up. We all know the story of Nicodemus and how he comes to Jesus at night, and he's one of the Pharisees. Well, if we look at the chapter right before, John is making some pretty big uh, statements about who Jesus is. Uh, John says, Jesus needed no one to testify him about man, for he knew what was in man. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus. Well, in the Greek, you can see that I think I can actually use a highlighter, can I? Yeah. I can use a laser pointer. Ooh, ooh, ooh look at that. Yeah, that. Uh, anthropo. Yes. Yeah, so anthropo, anthropo, anthropos. It's three different um, versions, I guess you could say, of the same word, all meaning man. And so what John is doing here is a play on words. Hey, 
Jesus knows what's in man. He knows that uh, uh, he doesn't need anyone to testify him uh, regarding man because he knows everything there is to know about man. Let me guess. Now, hey, look. Nicodemus is going to be called a man. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nicodemus is going to be referred to as a man. And while that not might seem like a big deal, uh, authors, if you've ever tried to write a book or write something, they are very intentional with the words that they use. When they want to convey a particular message, especially John, who's really big on using um, – you know, the dichotomy of light and darkness and good and evil. Uh, John is really particular with his words. So this is an instance where context is really important. Now, this is more literary context. Uh, what we're going to talk about is historical context. So I've got some questions to help us out with historical context. This is for the viewers. Me and Chris are not going to answer these questions necessarily. Maybe Chris has got some comments to kind of help you along in your thinking, but I want you to try and figure out these questions. And if you know the answers to these questions, you can leave them in the comments to this video. But Proverbs I know chapter... Been, I know how it's been preached before by people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 28 says, do not move the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. So here's my question. Looking at historical context, maybe looking at the literary context, what is the writer of Proverbs trying to say? Don't make changes from the way the things are. That sounds like a pretty good Church of Christ theology right there, right? Don't change things because that's how we've always done them. Do not steal. Do not remove guideposts. Well, that sounds pretty good. That matches up. None of the above, all of the above. So again, readers, I mean, listeners, you can uh, make a call on that. Here's the second one though. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. For the word of God is a living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So what is the writer of Hebrews trying to say? Is his point here that man is trichotomous, that we have three parts to us, that we have soul and spirit and heart? Is it saying that God's word is dynamic and not dead? That's a good one. Is it simply a warning to believers? Is it telling us to use God's word aggressively like a sword? Is it promoting violence or is it none of the above? Um, this is all going to do with literary and historical context. What, what's going on in the mind of the author? What kind of world is the author living in that he's going to use certain language? And why is that language important for us? Yeah. It's good stuff. It's good so, questions too. So again, Listeners, maybe we'll even have a prize for you. Maybe you'll get your name mentioned in the next video there if we you uh, can answer the question uh, correctly based on context. Going back to something you said a minute ago about the, the use of Anthropos, you know, James B. Jordan makes the point that liter lit literature in the ancient world was written very tightly. They didn't waste words because of the expensive nature of materials. Yeah. So when an ancient author says something multiple times, you better listen is making a point that, that we like as modern Americans we can bloviate we can expand our literature and just what have a, a waste of words but they were very efficient and economic of what they said because of writing materials so John and guys like him like when you get later in chapter 20 he says on the first day of the week two or three times and so that's mm. a clear marker something is special about the first day of the week a um, little a little clues like that. I thought Jordan, that was a pretty good point he made one time. That is. And I mean, that's, I mean, that's accurate. That's a, that would be historical analysis. What, what's the, what is the author dealing with when he's writing? Uh, not just in the world around him, but I mean, the tools that he has and how does that affect the way he writes? Yeah, that's, that's really good and pertinent for us uh, in our study too. So these are the three questions I would like you to walk away with and be able to ask yourself, um, when it comes to a particular passage that you might find difficult, what is the general historical milieu in which the writer speaks? What is his atmosphere? What is going on in the world around him? Who, who is ruling? Are there persecutions taking place? Uh, who is he surrounded by friends, enemies? Is he in prison? How does all of this affect writing? Second, what is the specific historical cultural context and purpose of the book? And again, we'll develop all these and kind of ask some questions about them. And then third, what is the immediate context of the passage under consideration? 
And again, that kind of goes back more to literary context. So it's something we're going to consider, but really I, I'm, uh, I'm kind of directing us more towards um, looking at historical and cultural context. So this is the first question. And here are some, uh, here are two example passages for us to look at. What is the general historical milieu in which the writer speaks? So Mark chapter seven and verse 11, uh, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees here and he's, uh, he's kind of being attacked. His disciples are being attacked for not washing hands uh, um, the way the Pharisees should. It's, it wasn't necessarily a law, but it was a you know, purification right before you uh, handled anything pure, before you were to worship. Uh, you had to go through these purification rites. Pharisees question Jesus on why his disciples aren't doing it, and they kind of come back with something, and Jesus comes back with, well, uh, he comes back with this, uh, with their teaching on Corbin. And what the Pharisees did is that they said, well, uh, when I die, I can take all of my money and donate it to the temple rather than helping out my parents who might be in need. And you say, why would they do that? Well, think of a Pharisee mentality. Donating all your money to the temple sounds really good. And people are going to look really favorably on you because you've done this holy and just thing. Maybe somewhat synonymous with... Um, I'm blanking on names. Acts. Tell me about Ananias and Sapphira. There we go. Ananias and Sapphira. I kept wanting to say Aquila and Priscilla. Mm -hmm. uh, Ananias and Sapphira. They do the same thing. They want to do this thing that looks good to other people. They did a somewhat Pharisee type move there. That's what Jesus is referring to is rather than obeying the command to honor your father and mother, uh, you're going to try to do something that looks good to everybody else. But that's not explained there in the text. All that is said is Corbin. Yeah, they expect you to know that. <laughs> right. Like what, you know, and um, I don't know. I guess that might be frustrating to some people that you have to study this um, or, or look up these words or understand what's going on. Um, but for me, that adds, I guess, depth to the text and adds a realness to it. I don't know. How, how do you work through that in that you actually have to spend time in studying these things? Part, part of it, like I, I look at it two different ways. The basic truth of scripture, like the stuff that's essential, you can understand without knowing these things. But if you want to get to some nuances like this passage, you know, there's already teaching in the Bible that God's word supersedes any tradition. So we know that. That's pretty simple yeah. to understand. This just adds kind of a, a nuance to it to help you understand what's happening in the text and what Jesus is really trying to say. And I do think there, there's actually a, a proverb, I think, and yeah, I should have looked this up before I even bring it up, but it's something about, it's to the glory of kings to have to search something out, that there's mm -hmm. something kingly about your priestly duty in Christ to actually have to grapple and work with the text. There's something good about that, wholesome, and, you know, people that will push back on that and say, I don't have time to, to do these kinds of things, I, I really kind of, I look at that in a funny way because I'll watch people spend a lot of time studying college football recruiting or the latest sleaze out there about some movie star. They'll, they'll pour through document after document on tips on hunting and fishing. Yeah. But then somehow, you know, they don't have time for this, you know, but I'm thinking yeah. this is the, the living word of God. I think we can, and we've never lived in a time where resources are readily available. I mean, it's amazing how many free things just, uh, Devin, I'll go on and say, you know, you said your birth year was 91. That was my first year of college. But uh, I will say <laughs> in 91, we did not have this stuff uh, readily available. You had to go to a library. You had to buy a book, and it was very expensive. But now you can have commentaries of information free. Yeah. But we've never had it easier. Yeah. I just downloaded R.T. Francis' uh, uh, commentary on Mark for free. R.T. Francis, I mean, and I've got like the paper copy right here. I'm looking at I it. I mean, yeah, and it's like, yeah. I mean, a great I, I, I knew I was going to use this verse, but I Googled real quick Corbin to get my context of what was going on so I could talk about it. I do that, I do that in an instant. I do that in 10 seconds. It's right there on Amazing. my fingertips. Yeah. I've got an exegetical guide on my phone where I can pull up any passage and it will parse all the Greek. It'll give me anything I want to know, uh, and it's made me lazy. Yeah. Really lazy. Yeah, no, me too. Uh, a, a second reference here for looking at the historical uh, setting of life, maybe another word to use here. 
uh, Sitzem Leiben, isn't that the yep. uh, German or whatever? Well, in the situation. Yeah. Uh, Genesis 29, 25. Uh, if, if you know that story of Jacob, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a beautiful, like, love story. Jacob sees Rachel, loves her, decides to work seven years for her father in order to get her hand in marriage, just to find out that uh, come marriage night, uh-oh, I accidentally slept with Leah, not Rachel. And we read that and be like, and we're like, okay, <laughs> yeah, no, it's kind of hard to understand. Jacob, you've got some problems, but if you understand that in their historical situation, the bride would have had her face fully covered, yeah. fully veiled. You have not seen a face, and the tent would have been left in darkness. Not only was it done in night, there would be no lamp, no fixture. Uh, you are not supposed to see the bride as you, in a sense, uh, depurified her, took her virginity from her. So to do that, she was fully veiled. It's completely dark. You have no idea what's going on. And so when the sun comes up the next morning, when they light a lamp, who does he see? It's not Rachel, it's Leah. And so knowing that context makes that make sense. Yeah. Uh, for modern readers, that we read it and we're like, Jacob, you're, that's ridiculous. Uh, you have to, to, to do it three more or two more times before he finally gets to Rachel also yeah. just doesn't make a lot of sense to people. But I think too, it helps with some um, arguments you have from skeptics where they'll read the text. Guys like, and I'll give you the, the usual ones we like to, to beat up on, but like Daniel Dennett and Dawkins and Sam Harris, they're horrible theologians, horrible. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know anything about biblical study. So they critique a caricature of what the Bible really teaches and make these great points and grand points. And when you learn these kind of details, this is not as scandalous, but there's some other things like harem warfare and stuff like that and hyperbole where people point to and, and really try to indict Christianity and, and Judaism too, uh, but they don't really know what they're talking about. Right. Yeah, that's a good point too. Helps us in our apologetic. Uh, this would be our second a question to ask. What is the specific historical cultural context and purpose of this book? Luke is really unique in this, in that he from the outright says, hey, I'm, I'm trying to do something different here. There, there have definitely been written accounts. There's been a lot of oral accounts. I'm trying to gather all this together and make an, a real uh, coherent, maybe even chronological, even though he's not explicitly saying that, chronological detailing of um, the gospel events. So he is in his cultural setting doing something different than what other people are doing. So he, he sets the stage for you. Um, another aspect of this is hortatory parts of writing, which is anytime you get to uh, a phrase that says, let us do something, do this. Um, this is most obvious for me and what, maybe I didn't clarify this. Understanding the purpose of a book. This is where hortatory speech comes in handy. Uh, Hebrews is a lot of theology. You go through the first 10 chapters and you are slammed in the face with Christology, atonement theory, all of these different things talking about Jesus. And it's really easy to start going, okay, well, hold on. How, what, do you, what am I supposed to do with this? Well, what is the purpose in you just dispelling all of this? Well, finally, he gets to chapter 10 in like verse... 2021 and he starts saying things like let us do this together let's see if i can pull this up yeah can you see that on my screen i can i pull up the wrong here we go there it is. let's come down to chapter 10 here and this is again chapter 10 first 10 chapters are all about um th uh theology it's who christ is how he is greater than moses how he is greater than melchizedek how he's greater than all these people. And you finally get down here to chapter 19. Therefore, okay, because of all this that I've talked about, uh, because we have confidence to enter into the holy places, uh, we have a new way open for us through the curtain, that is through Jesus's flesh. Since we have a great priest over the house of God, I'll even bump up this uh, text here. Oikon to, to Theo. There we go. Let us draw near with a true heart, full of assurance. This is the point. This is the purpose of the Hebrew writer, what he's trying to say, 
is because of all these great things we have in Jesus, we need to now do this. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast. Let us consider how to stir up good works, not neglecting to meet together. For if we go on sin, that's his purpose. There's his point. That's what you're looking for. That is his historical cultural context. He is writing to a group of believers. Most likely this is, you know, sermonic format. You know, he's like preaching a sermon here. He's given you all the, all the reasons, uh, the reason why God is good. And now he's hitting you in Hebrews chapter 10. Okay. This is what now is expected from you. This is the purpose of my writing. This is why I've said all these things in these previous nine, 10 and a half, nine and a half chapters. Does that make sense? It does. I, it, it makes perfect sense that yeah. you get that let us language and it's probably an exhortation. It's a sermon. Yeah. We would with the audience even today. I know it's the, an ancient document, but we would do that. You know, let us as a church go forward and do these things. You know, All that and, and theology it, gets to 10. Here's why I've told you all this. Yeah. We draw near in confidence. It's assembly language too. We assemble together. Let us continue to do these things because of all that I've said. And, and I don't think it's a stretch to say that uh, it's not necessarily hortatory speech here, let us language, but the culmination of the gospel comes in in Jesus's last words to his disciples. Okay, now here's my story. Here's everything I've done for you. See me in my resurrected form. What does all this mean? Go out and preach the gospel. Yeah. So you can save the lost. Um, that might be a, an, an inference there. And this is our last question. What is the immediate context of the passage under consideration? And this might be a little uh, less fun because it's a little less learning about backgrounds and learning about the way things, the way people did things, but it's, it's more looking at literary context. And, and really all this requires, if I could break this down, you know, you see, I got four points here. I'm going to say these, but I'm going to simplify them. Identifying major blocks of material and how they fit in. So chapters, paragraphs, how do they all fit in? Determine the perspective. Uh, a lot of times, this is especially we're doing it, you know, with the kids right now, I'm in the book of Kings. Perspective really matters. You're either supposed to see things through the eyes of man or through the eyes of God. Sometimes when an author is writing through the perspective of God, he's not necessarily saying everything done by these characters are good things. You know, it never explicitly says that David sinned in having multiple wives, but in him having multiple wives and children through those multiple wives, his kingdom is divided, you know, and, and perspective really matters there because that can be a stumbling block to somebody who says, oh, look, the Bible promotes polygamy. Yeah. Well, no, it really doesn't. If you uh, start looking at perspective. Kind of gets into your third one, descriptive or prescriptive. You know, is it describing yes. bad behavior or is it saying bad behavior is good? Right. Th those definitely bleed in, into both. So you don't, you don't just pick something out and say, oh, that is telling me to do this. That is my, my prescription for my issue. Now, it might just be saying, hey, this is the way things are in our fallen human world. Uh, not necessarily the way that you should live it out. Uh, another important part is identifying a person or group of persons for whom the passage is, is intended. If you've, been, if you've been following our Romans podcast, Romans chapter 9, and we're going to go through Romans chapter 11, that is, that's really pertinent that you understand who the person is or the groups of person who is being uh, accounted for. Um, but if I could simplify this, uh, if, if this is too much to take in, do, do it this way. When looking at a particular verse, back up, read the chapter, read the paragraph it's in, then go down to, to in each individual sentence, and then go down to each individual word. And if you can break those up and find the meanings of all those things, uh, finding the context becomes much more uh, simple. It, it's a process, though. It's not like it's just going to come to you like that. But uh, there, are, there are certain parts in Scripture where this is necessary to, to break things down like this. And thinking of Romans 9, you know, I just read, I'm reading a commentary right now on Romans 9, and the author, Michael Bird, said, it's not as if Paul in Romans 9 is holding Calvin's Institutes of Religion and Arminius in the other hand and deciding if Paul's talking about predestination. Yeah. You know, if that's... It's not like Paul's holding those work to go, well, let me give you what I think about predestination. I guess it's a better way to, dis to describe it. The context of that passage is what about Israel? Yeah. What do we do with Israel? 
Was God faithful or not? Was he unfaithful in how he dealt with Israel? Will Israel be saved? That's a really good question. And so we've got to understand the context because if we don't, we'll, we'll ask the wrong questions of the text and, and try to mine things from the text that it's not saying to defend a position. Right. So hopefully all those steps make sense. And, uh, and I think those, the, the three questions are pretty basic. They're broad enough that it can really lead you down a, a long road of, of study, definitely. But like Chris just got kind of done uh, reminding us, all of this is at our fingertips. Um, if, you, if you're uncertain about a particular site or a particular uh, book, you know, ask Chris, uh, ask me and, and get our opinion on it. You know, um, because we get to spend so much time in Google studies, we kind of know where different people are writing from and uh, their intent and I guess what is quote unquote safe or not. So um, if you've ever got any questions in like, uh, like that, be sure to let us know. Yeah. We like those kinds of questions. That's, that's not bothersome. Yeah. Or yeah. we're, we're those type of nerds that man, if you, if you can get us started, we'll go. Yeah. But that's it. That's what I got. That was really good. That was very beneficial and uh, practical tools people can use with a text. I'm interested to see what they think of uh, Proverbs 22 and Hebrews 4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all got to make sure to comment and give us your answers to them. You don't remember what we're talking about. You got to rewind and go back and look at it. <laughs> Watch the video all over again. Yep. <laughs> well, Devin, this is awesome, man. Once again, very good stuff, practical. And, and we're building up a library, I guess, so to speak, with these videos of tools and methods. Uh, this is video eight. We've got two more left. Do you want to just tell people real quick what the next two videos are so they can look forward to it? Yeah, number nine is we're going to be looking at language. We're going to do a little bit of language studies. And kind of how I brought up these verses and kind of showed some things in the Greek, I'm going to show you not only some tools and some free tools at your disposal, but also how to work them a little bit. And so when you get to looking at a word, you say, oh, what does this mean? Um, hopefully that'll be simplified for you a little bit. So we're going to be looking at language studies, words, syntax, do a broad. It, it won't be too deep. I'll, we'll keep it all surface level and keep it for, uh, you know, anybody that's interested in, in getting into this for the first time. And then our last video, we'll be, we'll be talking about reflecting over the text. And again, that's kind of going back to a bit less of a, a methodical type video where we have steps of doing something. It's going to be a bit more introspective, like when we talked about reader bias. So um, it, it's a good way to kind of close out our segment and, and realign our will with God's, so to say. It's really easy for people to get wrapped up in all of these ways of studying the Bible and then not actually applying them to our lives. So that'll be our last video's topic. And here's a question I would like to ask our listeners. We're going to be doing classes like this for a period of time. I don't know how long, but at least until maybe the fall, maybe through the summer. So we're going to run out of these videos pretty soon in two weeks. And mm -hmm. we would love to have topics. I mean, I would, that we could discuss together. There's got to be something that people want to hear about. Some hot topic uh, that we might could tackle of course we want to come not from some other perspective, but what the Bible may say about it. Yeah. And we would love to hear from our, our listeners. What would be something they would want to hear in some classes? We could maybe put three or four or five classes together, just some freestanding classes on topics. Mm -hmm. I think that would be fun to hear. Yeah. Okay. What, now that we've learned about studying the Bible, what are you interested in? You know, Definitely. We open the, the doors up to that. So email us. Our emails are easy. Uh, I'm Chris at WCC.church. And Devin, it's Devin with an I, Devin at WCC.church. So shoot us an email and tell us what you're interested in hearing, and we'll put our heads together and tackle some of those topics maybe. Yeah, sounds good to me. Devin, this is fun. I appreciate it, Chris. All right, brother. You have a great day. You too. See you. All right, bye.